This is the Tampa Convention Center, a 600,000 square foot facility located in Tampa, Florida. This facility has the capacity to hold up to approximately 32,500 people at full capacity. The main components of a DAS system usually entail a source. The source is either a base station, or BTS, or a bidirectional amplifier, otherwise known as a repeater. If a repeater system, a donor antenna is required. The donor antenna is typically placed on a rooftop or somewhere where it can be oriented to pull the signal from the closest macro site. That donor antenna is then connected through coax cabling, down through a lightning protection assembly, and then plugged into the repeater or BDA. The BDA repeater will take the input signal from that donor antenna, amplify it to overcome any losses, and then distribute that to the head-end equipment. The head-end equipment, or DAS interface, will then convert that radio frequency signal into light to be distributed out through fiber optic cabling to each of the remote locations. A typical installation will show remote locations on each floor. Each remote location, or remote hub, or remote, will convert the light from the fiber optic cable back into radio frequency, add amplification to that, and then distribute it out through coaxial cable to the indoor antennas. Depending upon the application, you can either use an omnidirectional antenna or a directional antenna to meet your coverage objectives. The purpose of a DAS in this facility would be provide additional coverage and capacity as well as improved data speeds throughout the facility. It also provides an offload from the surrounding macro sites. Connectivity Wireless had 30 days to complete this installation to meet the timeline for the Republican National Convention of 2012. So now we're in the head-end location for the Tampa Convention Center uh, AT&T DAS system. Uh, the purpose of this DAS is to provide increased capacity and coverage while inside the facility for all major events. Uh, the main impetus of installing this system specifically was for the uh, Republican National Convention that was actually held uh, just across the street uh, uh, earlier in 2012. So let's talk specifics about the equipment. Uh, as we discussed before, the, the head end is, is really the brains, the main uh, components of a DAS system. Uh, that's where the interface from the outside, whether it's via a BDA or a repeater, uh, would come in over an antenna through that BDA that source would then plug into the head end of the DAS and then be distributed over fiber to remote locations. Uh, in this case, uh, the main purpose of the DAS is to provide increased capacity for not only just voice calls, but data calls and data speeds as well. LTE, uh, the, the capacity of LTE is a, is a major uh, driver of all DAS systems that we're seeing installed today, and capacity is key. So let's go through this a little bit. This happens to be, uh, this head end is an eight sector head end. So uh, AT&T is driving this with eight separate base stations. They're actually using three frequency bands that they're licensed for here. Their LTE is operating on 700 megahertz. Uh, they have voice and data, uh, UMTS voice and data 3G that's being operated across uh, the 850 cell band as well as the 1900 megahertz band. So let's talk specifically about that. We have multiple base stations that are feeding this DAS. So speaking specifically to this sector, this is uh, the radio interface unit, or RIU-3. This is a piece of gear uh, that is manufactured by Mobile Access. This system happens to be a Mobile Access 2000 TSX system, and we'll get into the TSX portion in a minute. Basically, it means uh, tri-service unit. We have three frequency bands that are coming across this system specifically. So let's talk about them. In your radio interface unit, you have the radio interface unit chassis itself, which provides all the combining, and then you have specific frequency modules to interface with your base stations. In this case, we have 700 LTE, so 700 megahertz LTE band. We have the cellular 850 band, and then we have the PCS with G-Block compliant 1900 megahertz band. So essentially, each of these units interface specifically with each corresponding base station that's operating on those frequencies. As you can see on the front, you have a lot of combining that's happening. So your output's into your coherent combiner. Then your combiner will then take that RF, level it out. The RF comes out of the uh, RIUs, 
it's balanced, and then plugs into the base eights. The base eights, which you can see here, essentially means it's a base unit that converts from RF, so radio frequency, to light over fiber. Uh, in this specific case, you'll notice that you have four locations where the, uh, where the uplink and downlink fibers are plugged into. What that corresponds to, and you can, if you're looking at a head end, you can very quickly tell, especially with mobile access, how many remote units a specific sector has. This happens to be sector seven. This sector has four remote units. Now, one thing I'll draw your attention to is the spares we have here. Should the carrier decide that at a later date they need to add more coverage, they need to sectorize, they need to, uh, to improve data speeds, they can add remote units up to double. So the infrastructure here will support growth out, to, out past 2015. I want to draw your attention to something specific to these sectors. You'll notice that there are two radio interface units here and there are two base 8 units here. The reason for that is this system is MIMO, multi-input, multi-output. That is specifically to cover uh, the 700 megahertz band, the LTE, and to provide uh, in improved data speeds. So you'll notice that there are a couple blank locations here. That is because this system is established to be MIMO for LTE only. It's, there's no need to run the 850 and the 1900 in a MIMO configura configuration. However, what that does allow, and just as we talked about with the spares here, it does allow for expansion later if additional carriers need to be added on either the 850 megahertz uh, spectrum or on the 19 megahertz spectrum. So what you find is with this configuration as it is now, there's plenty of room for expansion again out past 2015. So as you can see down here, this is MIMO path B or data stream 2, uh, depending upon the nomenclature that, that you're using and which wireless carrier you're working for. And you have the two blank panels here that can be expanded to whatever frequencies that you require. Additionally, you'll, you'll see that there are two base units. Again, MIMO path A, MIMO path B, or data stream one, data stream two, LTE. Another component that I wanted to point out while we're here in the head end is the remote units. Uh, we, we discussed earlier this is a mobile access 2000 uh, TSX system and I wanted to point out a couple of the remotes. It just so happens that this configuration we have some antennas that's just outside of this penthouse room where the, where the head end is located and those antennas are being driven specifically by this remote unit here. Again, as we discussed earlier with the, when we talked about the head end equipment, you have MIMO path A and MIMO path B for the LTE, the 700 megahertz LTE. That's exactly what we have here. So this remote unit is a standalone TSX remote unit you can see the, uh, the internals supporting each frequency. You have a cell PCS module and then you have a 700 megahertz add-on module in here. This is where the fiber optics from the head end unit is being plugged in. Again, down here we have the same configuration because we want to support expanded services out past 20, 2015. So we still have a cell PCS that happens to be inactive here, but the 700 LTE add-on is operational for MIMO Path B. So this is another example of the distribution antennas that can be used in a DAS system. It has a much higher gain and it also happens to be cross-polarized. So the, the benefits of this is obviously you're going to get better propagation throughout a large and open area. It also happens to be cross-polarized into where you can do MIMO path A feed here, MIMO path B feed here. So you basically get both of your MIMO paths into a single antenna that's cross-polarized in here. You can see for, for this specific application we have one here and then we have one that is here facing the opposite direction to cover this large convention area again. Uh, MIMO path A, MIMO path B cross-polarized and of course the all-important safety tether because we are over a, a, an active convention space. So this is just an alternate mounting configuration for the TSX cabinets. They can be side by side here. Um, it just depends on where your specific application states that you need it to be installed. Uh, I wanted to give you an idea of where the fiber splicing occurs. This of course brings your trunk fiber in to this location and then we splice into the remotes from there. Uh, you can tell we have this location which is the mobile access TSX cabinets, but another wireless carrier also has a remote location here as well. This is a good example of the Andrew Ion B remotes.
As you can see, these antennas were mounted outside. The main purpose of these antennas were to provide coverage in the water side area and provide a capacity offload from the macro site that is just across the waterway. Connectivity Wireless was able to complete the installation of this eight sector distributed antenna system for a major wireless carrier on time and under budget. This is Raymond James Stadium, home of the National Football League's Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the University of South Florida Bulls. This facility is approximately 1.6 million square feet and it's located in Tampa, Florida. This stadium has the capacity to hold up to 65,900 people. Why would the carrier need a DAS in this facility? The main purpose would be to provide additional capacity for the users during game days and special events, as well as improve throughput speeds for data and multimedia usage. During the 2011-2012 football season, there were an average of 50,000 people attending each game. To install this 23-sector DAS, Connectivity Wireless had 60 days to complete the installation before the start of the 2012-2013 football season. So now we're at the head end at the Raymond James Stadium distributed antenna system for AT&T Wireless. So what we have here is, as you can see, we have a 23-sector DAS system serving the stadium. Uh, basically, it's the same setup as we had at Tampa Convention Center. It is a mobile access 2000 TSX system. Uh, again, very, same, uh, or very similar architecture as we had at Tampa Convention Center. We've got the uh, radio interface units uh, for MIMO Path A and Path B, or Data Stream 1, Data Stream 2. Uh, we're running the same frequency bands because we're in the same city, Tampa. Uh, 700 megahertz, 800 megahertz, and 1900 megahertz, and again, path B here. Same setup here. We're, we happen to be using a base 4 here instead of the base 8s that we saw at Tampa Convention Center. In the more complex DAS systems, it's sometimes necessary to balance the signal before it goes into the head end of the DAS. What you see in this shot are the CCI DAS interface trays. These are high power variable attenuators that allow us to balance the signal prior to hitting the head end of the DAS. What you see here is a tray filled with all of the fiber optic cables that extend from the head end location out to all of the remotes. This is a good example of the Andrew panel antennas. These antennas are made for indoor use and as you can see here their primary function is to cover this long hallway in the service area. This is an example of an outdoor location for an indoor antenna. As you can see We've run all of the Trilogy coax feeding these antennas through this conduit. These are the Andrew Omni antennas that are being used to service the elevator area in the suites. As you may have noticed with most of the antennas throughout this video, they're separated by about 5 feet. That allows the MIMO separation for spatial diversity. This is an example of one of the antennas that's serving the upper concourse area, the upper seats of the bowl. As you can see mounted on the light stands, pointed at a 65 degree down tail angle, the intent of these antennas is to cover that upper area and those upper seats. This is a shot from the front side from the fan's perspective of what the antennas would look like on the light stand. The remotes required to service the antennas in the light stand had to be mounted in an area that was close enough to provide adequate signal without loss across the cable. To do that, we mounted these remote locations inside NEMA 3R enclosures to prevent moisture and humidity from affecting the indoor rated remote boxes. Through a junction box, you can see that all of the coax is extended from these NEMA enclosures up to the light stand antennas. This is an example of the antennas covering the end zone seats. As you can see, we have an antenna location in each corner and then a location that's on the scoreboard stand just below the play clock. These antennas will also cover the concession areas. Connectivity Wireless was able to complete this 23-sector distributed antenna system for a major wireless carrier, both on time and under budget. This system was active during the 2012-2013 NFL season. Connectivity Wireless, connecting everyone, everywhere.